Zion Williamson has expanded his game to include a mid-range jumper. That's important for the playoffs, but not more important than other aspects of the offense that the Pelicans are going to need. I'll tell you what those are, plus another Brandon Ingram injury update in today's episode of Locked On Pelicans. Let's go. You are Locked On Pelicans, your daily New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to another edition of Locked On Pelicans, the daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Pelicans at NBA. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube. I'm your host, Pelicans Insider, credential member of the media, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter. Here with y'all on this Thursday, we're going to look at Zion Williamson and his mid-range jumper. I want to look at the standings a little bit as well, give you an update on Brain and Ingram, and talk about a little bit of some stuff I'm worried about when it comes to referees and some weirdness going on with them right now. And of course, thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We're here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast. Join almost 10,000 Pelicans fans on YouTube as well. Today's episode of Locked On Pelicans brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150. Win or lose. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On to get started. And of course, we come in every day. That means you listen Monday through Friday to Locked On Pelicans. And don't forget, live in-person show Monday, April 15th at 7 p.m. Central. I'm going to keep plugging it. I hope to see you all there. Aaron Summers is going to be a guest of mine on there. So will Rel Myers of the Pels 12 and one or two others. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll get you set for the postseason. So let's get into Zion Williamson in the mid-range jumper, hitting two of them against the Phoenix Suns. And that was kind of eye-opening because it was the first time he had ever done something like that. And it was useful. When you look at how teams are defending him, they are just simply trying to stop him from getting to the rim because he is an absolute monster and nearly unstoppable there. And force the team to do literally anything else. So while I don't want Zion Williamson taking a lot of mid-range jumpers, and we'll get into that in a second here, every now and then, particularly in one area, which I'll tell you about in a moment, I think is going to be a really useful thing. But I don't think it's more important than other aspects of the offense to space the court, because that's what this comes down to, right? Spacing the court for Zion Williamson so that he can get to the rim. If you turn him into a jump shooter, into a three-point shooter, you may as well get another player because you're minimizing what he does incredibly well, which is get to the rim at a rate basically nobody else does, hopefully gets fouled and then goes to the line as well for an and one. But you need to space the court to do it. So the mid range jumper you saw was wide open for him there because teams were just the the Suns were just walling off the rim and saying okay do that I truly think that if he were to take five to six of those or more per game that's a win for the defense they're going to be very happy with him taking mid-range jumpers instead of scoring at the rim the average short mid-range jumper in terms of field goal percentage which is what he took is let's round up call it 44 percent that is about the same as long mid-range, short mid-range, and it pales in comparison to the 66.2, and again, this is average, shooting percent at the rim, basically in the restricted area. There's a significant difference there. It's over. It's about 22% or so. You want to be taking the most efficient shots, and for Zion, that is going to be at the rim. So rather than taking mid-range jumpers, what I think is more important to the offense, and again, the mid-range jumper is good. I like that. That was a great thing that he broke out. I thought it was impressive. Don't get me wrong. What I think is more important, though, is spacing the court properly for him. And that's going to be what they've been doing somewhat recently these past two games, particularly in that second half against the Portland Trailblazers and the whole game against the Phoenix Suns, right? When the teams were playing drop coverage, you, you sag your big back uh, towards the paint to kind of take away the rim. For the Pelicans to then try and shoot over that was a really good thing. You know, C.J. McCollum taking those threes is important. Trey Murphy taking those threes is important. Everybody taking those threes is important. And now that they're poised to get Brandon Ingram back, and the update on that, by the way, is now I'm not expecting him to play in two games before the end of the regular season. I'm expecting him to maybe play in that Lakers game is what it sounds like it's going to be to me. Willie Green before the game or after the game, I forget which, against Portland said, you know, he's doing some one-on-one -on -one work. They like their guys to get to five-on-five -five before they let him play out there in a game. So I think with their practice schedule, and like lack of it coming up, I think you'll likely see him against the Lakers and instead in that instead of two games. But he's going to need to take more threes. The three-point shooting is really the key to opening things up 
for Zion Williamson. The mid-range jumper he has helps. It's a tool, but it shouldn't be the one that you rely on primarily. More off-ball movement, more cutting, those type of things, using pick-and-roll actions, all of that is the way to get Zion space and going and scoring at the rim. And if the Pelicans want to win you know, a postseason series, they're going to need to find ways to do that. You know, if if it's where they just wall him off and he's ineffective for four games, that's going to be a problem. So you need guys shooting efficient shots, three-point shots, to give him a little bit of space when he's out there on the court and letting him do the rest because he's been playing exceptionally good basketball, especially defensively too, and you need to try and make the most of it. So back to the mid-range. While I don't think it's the most important thing to him scoring and this team being effective, it's not a bad thing. And I think... You know, he broke that late in the fourth quarter, those mid-range jumpers against the Phoenix Suns, because again, that's what the defense gave you. You also don't have to take what the defense gives you. You can try and manufacture better things and break that defense, right? A lot of y'all, you know, say, well, take what the defense gives you in the playoffs. It's the mid-range jumper. Yeah, but those same people who say that to me are also like, why don't the Pelicans impose their will on teams more? Do it and don't settle for mid-range jumpers that don't have as high of a field goal percentage as other areas. But Zion with the mid-range, he broke that out late in the game. And again, that was good. It helped them win a very close game in a game they needed to win. I think he needs to also break that out early on in a game. And I think if you break that mid-range jumper out you know, in the first quarter on a first couple of possessions where they're going to be walling you off, it now makes them have to reconsider their whole defensive game plan. If you can do some of the things we are talking about here, CJ shooting over drop coverage, Trey, all of those other shots, right? Zion's mid-range jumper. That's going to make them reconsider their defensive game plan over the entirety of the game. And the second they start adjusting from that, changing from that, the sooner you can get Zion going downhill and attack the basket in an even more efficient way. And I think that's really a big key to all of this. So doing this stuff early in the first quarter, not having those kind of sluggish starts where the ball's not moving and it makes them easy to defend. If you do that, you're going to open things up immediately. And that's going to make this team really scary and tough to stop for even the top defensive teams in the playoffs when you get Zion going and doing the things that he's capable of doing you've got to help him to get him there and he's capable of doing it on his own dude's like a sheer force of will right I don't mind him sometimes just attacking those walls and trying to bust on through a wall and knock it down but the earlier you can open things up the better your offense is going to flow and then the defense can get back get set force a turnover now maybe you can get out and run in transition so now you're getting the best of both worlds transition points and half court offense that's definitely what the Pelicans need to be doing so hopefully we see Zion do more of the mid-range jumper in the first quarter in the first half but also just more from the team in general to really open things up for him then I think that's going to be the key going forward so speaking of going forward let's look at the standings here and kind of project them out a little bit what's the biggest game for the pelicans coming up but let's not also look at the suns and the kings i also want to look at the top of the western conference denver timberwolves okc who is tiebreakers things like that because that's going to influence who the pelicans potentially play in the postseason especially now that they control their own destiny for the sixth seed that's coming up here next in today's episode of locked on pelicans Right now, though, I'm excited to tell you about NOLA Star Bar. I'd like to invite you to come to the NOLA Star Bar. It's right down the street from the Smoothie King Center, so it's there for your pre- and post-game libations. They play every Pelicans home game and away game throughout the season and in the playoffs on all of their big screens. They also have a pool table, video poker, an internet jukebox, and karaoke every Wednesday night. They also feature over 100 worldwide spirits and a hefty selection of local beers. A true Pelicans fans bar, they even created and produced the Pelicans at anthem called fly pelicans fly complete with a music video join your pel- your fellow pelicans fans at nola star bar at 12 uh, sorry 212 loyola 212 loyola avenue open seven days a week 6 p.m through 4 a.m and check out their pelicans anthem on the nola star bar page on youtube Today's episode of Locked On Pelicans is also brought to you by Nissan. Are you the type of driver that likes to push things a little bit further like I am? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. There's the 2024 Nissan Rogue, which is perfect for city drives and great escapes. And they have class exclusive Google built in, which is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. So gone are the days of connecting your phone, Google Assistant, Google Maps, Google Play Store, 
are all built right into the 12.3 inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect midsize crossover for your next adventure. There's also the Nissan Armada, which is going to change what you expect from a full size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to 8 in first class luxury and style, tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Nissan Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Armada, or the Nissan Pathfinder and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen today and every day. We are here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast, covering everything you want to know about this Pelicans team. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and join almost 10,000 Pelicans fans on YouTube. Become an everydayer means you listen Monday through Friday. And if you are an everydayer, let me know in the comments down below on YouTube and show up to the live in-person recording of Locked On Pelicans Monday, April 15th, 7 p.m. at Mid-City Yacht Club. We're going to get you set for the postseason, preview the matchup ahead, whether it's a playing tournament or the actual postseason, and then we have a live Q&A after. Aaron Summers of Pelicans.com is going to be there with me, sideline reporter as well. You're also going to have Rel Myers of the Pels 12. We'll have giveaways from the Pels 12. It's going to be a lot of fun. One or two other guests as well, just waiting on full-on confirmation, but they've said yes, assuming they don't have to travel so hopefully we're going to get even more people there it's going to be a lot of fun for a live in-person episode of locked on pelicans so let's look at the schedule here for the pelicans going forward they have three games remaining and i think they're in good position to try and win these games you have the kings the warriors the lakers the the lakers game may be meaningless by the end of the season when you look at these three games the biggest one is going to be the sacramento kings that's the team that is kind of chasing them in the standings along with the phoenix suns right now you're two games up on them if you win that game one that's demoralizing because you've beaten them five times this season but also then you Put three games, in theory, as of now, between you and them in the standings, and I think that's a really big thing. And I think that basically effectively seals them into the playing tournament, and you don't need to stress nearly as much about them. So it comes down to kind of the Phoenix Suns with some of this. So for the Pelicans to have the succeed, I do think they definitely need to beat Sacramento. And when you look at the remaining schedule for the Phoenix Suns, it's pretty tough too. They play the Clippers when I'm record I'm recording this early on Wednesday because I have a flight, so I can't wait till the games end. But Phoenix plays the Clippers again. Then they have the Timberwolves, and then they have the Kings. That's not an easy schedule whatsoever. So they're gonna be in a tough spot. So I think you're really looking at New Orleans being in a good spot for the sixth seed with everything. You've just got to really beat the Kings. The ideal is then that the Clippers, hopefully when I'm before, you know, I'm recording this before the game is the Clippers beat the Phoenix Suns again, and then Phoenix maybe loses or beats Sacramento. I think it just depends on where it is in the standings. Probably looking at that point, assuming New Orleans takes care of business against Sacramento, that you want Sacramento to then beat Phoenix, and then that will really solidify the Pelicans in the sixth seed. So to sum it up, here's how I got to do this. New Orleans beats the Kings. New Orleans beats Sacramento, Los Angeles Clippers beats the Phoenix Suns, and then the Sacramento Kings beat, um, also beat, the, or sorry, then, yeah, then the Sacramento Kings also beat the Phoenix Suns, and I think that's really the way to go about it. If Sacramento beats LA and the Pelicans lose to the Kings, you definitely need different things to happen at that point. At that point, the six seed's probably out of grasp, and you don't want to fall to the eighth spot, so then you want Sac um, Sacramento to lose to Phoenix. It's all going to come down to the final game, basically, of the regular season, it feels like here. But let's look at, say, the Pelicans get the six seed. They control their destiny. Let's give them let's give them the benefit of the doubt here, even if that's maybe the fool's thing to do. You know, let's look at Minnesota, OKC, and Denver. They're all fighting for the top spot in the West. It's tight, right? You have Minnesota and Denver tied. They play Wednesday night, so before uh, I'm recording this before the game. Then you have OKC just a game behind. And when you look at their schedules, this is going to be really interesting because the Minnesota has a Tim, uh, has the Minnesota Timberwolves have the tiebreaker over Denver and Oklahoma City Thunder. The Oklahoma City Thunder have the tiebreaker over Denver. So if Denver goes three and zero because they played the Timberwolves, it means the Timberwolves best can go two and one. So if that's the case. And you get OKC going two and one. Their schedule is kind of a mixed bag. You have the Bucks in there. Um, they have the Dallas Mavericks who are playing really good basketball, and the and the San Antonio Spurs. So it's two and one for them. 
two and one for Minnesota, three and zero oh for Denver would mean with the tiebreakers, Denver gets the one seed. Then the Timberwolves are going to be the two seed by their tiebreaker over OKC, and then OKC would be, and then they would also just be above them too. Then OKC would also be the third seed, even if OKC goes three and zero oh, and the Timberwolves go two and one because they have the tiebreaker over them. So it looks like barring some sort of like collapse in here and Denver's schedule is pretty easy so as long as they get this win over the Timberwolves I think they're almost assuredly going to be the one seed here however the two seed could be the better thing if you look at it because then you avoid the Clippers or Mavs in the postseason second round which I think can be important so that three six spot you know, which is what the Pelicans would be looking at in the best case scenario now for the postseason, uh, is looking like it's going to be Oklahoma City. And that could be good or bad. OKC doesn't really have the playoff experience. There's a lot of talent there. They've beaten New Orleans pretty handily at times, though New Orleans has come back to beat them too. So looking at these two, you know, at the matchup, that's maybe what we're going to be previewing at the live show. But when you look at it, there's a lot the Pelicans don't control. The things they do control the most are beat the next three teams, and you are for sure in as the sixth seed with the Sacramento Kings, the Golden State Warriors, then the Los Angeles Lakers. You know, that Warriors game could also be a little bit meaningless, too. You know, they're, they're more or less going to be locked into the tenth seed. There is a chance they could get up to eight. That would be their best case scenario, so they're not going to give up. We'll see what happens over the next couple of games here. Their schedule, let me see who they play. They got an easier schedule. The toughest game is going to be against the Pelicans. Then they've got the Jazz and the Portland Trailblazers. And New Orleans is playing on the second night of a back-to-back in that one. They don't have a particularly great advantage. But I think they're better than them. We've seen them blow that team out a bunch this year and kind of handle them. So they don't have anything that can kind of stop Zion Williamson. So it's going to be a really interesting end to the season. We're going to be doing a lot of scoreboard watching over the next couple of days here as we get into it. So this is going to potentially be different. Maybe we'll do another update tomorrow that we're going to want to talk about the game and everything on Friday. But we'll see. The standings are going to be changing kind of daily. It's a little bit of madness in the Western Conference right now. And I kind of love it, to be perfectly honest with you. It's been a lot of fun. And if Zion's going to break that mid-range jumper out, if they're going to keep playing good basketball and making good adjustments, and this Pelicans team has been making good adjustments, I feel confident about their chances to get the six seed. Not guaranteed, but they're looking to be in a very good spot right now. And hopefully that's going to be the way that it goes because getting some like pure postseason basketball, giving this team a couple of days off to rest and things like that, I think would be a really important thing. Let me see what their playoff probability is right now. For This is on Basketball Dash Reference. For the six seed, they're saying it's 81.3% that the Pelicans could get the six seed right now. That sounds pretty good to me. 9.7% for the seventh seed, 4.6% for the eighth seed, 0.8% for the five seed. That's not going to happen. They're looking at the sixth seed kind of right now, but one game could, could change things, and those playoff probabilities can update pretty quickly and before we know it for everything. So coming up next, one thing that could really derail the Pelicans in the regular season or the postseason – Referees, And there was some weirdness in some games the other night. Let's look at that. That's coming up here next in today's episode of Locked on Pelicans. Right now, though, I'm excited to tell you about FanDuel because it's playoff time in the NBA and NHL. Baseball's in full swing, and FanDuel is your place to bet on every game. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed. That's $150 bucks, win or lose. So you can bet on everything from slap shots to home runs to slam dunks, all on an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. It really is super easy to use. I love the layout there. You can find the parlays that you want. You can look at other popular parlays that are out there. The player props, just the money line whatever you're looking for they have it and it's just laid out beautifully on the FanDuel app so what are you waiting for visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and make your first bet an automatic win that's 150 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed win or lose FanDuel America's number one sports book and the official sports book of locked on And thank you for making Locked On Pelicans your first listen. Today and every day, we are here Monday through Friday, the number one Pelicans podcast covering everything you want to know about this Pelicans team. Subscribe wherever you get your podcast and join almost 10,000 Pelicans fans on YouTube as well. 
Well, and don't forget, come to the live episode, live in-person recording. I was going to say taping, but it's not. Live episode of Locked On Pelicans at Mid-City Yacht Club, Monday, April 15th at 7 p.m. Central. I'll buy you a drink there, potentially. It's going to be a lot of fun. Great guest, Aaron Summers from the Pelicans, Rel Myers, a couple of others. We're going to get you set for the postseason, then do a live Q&A after the fact. I can't wait to see you there. It's going to be the first one of these we've done in a very, very long time. So it's going to be a lot of fun, and I hope to see you all there. Mid-City Yacht Club, 7 p.m. Central, Monday, April 15th. Get your taxes done, and then come talk Pelicans here. So, one thing jumped out at me in a game last night. And I don't often, you know, look, you don't, you care about the Pelicans. You don't necessarily care about other games, other teams, and I think that's a great thing. But, and that's why I don't talk tons about the, the league overall or other things that I just find interesting, because I want to keep this relevant to you and what you care about. But I want to look at the... Boston Celtics losing to the Milwaukee Bucks 104-91. This game's weird. This game was weird. Not because, look, the, the Celtics have nothing to play for. It has nothing to do with really the play of the players out there on the court and the Bucks, you know, potentially losing Giannis and the Celtics just looking uninterested because, again, who cares? It's this. These two teams played and they combined, get this, combined for two free throw attempts combined for two free throw attempts. The Boston Celtics shot zero in this game. The Milwaukee Bucks shot two. Now, this was, again, a weird game. The way they were playing, there wasn't a ton of stuff in the paint. There were a lot of threes being taken. The Celtics took 52 threes. The Milwaukee Bucks took 36. But zero free throws for one team and just two for another is super weird. And I've talked about this and you've seen this. The offic uh, officials are calling games slightly differently in the NBA right now. There's just free throws have been going down and that hurts a team like New Orleans with a player like Zion Williamson. I don't think there's a grand conspiracy or anything like that. Look, just officiating is a, is a human thing. It can have some weirdness to it. But if they're going to call games like that, where you just don't do anything... That's going to concern me because Zion Williamson, we know, doesn't go to the line nearly as much. If you're an everyday or you remember a show that I did on that where we looked at the numbers, I don't think he needs to go like double what he's doing, but three, four more times kind of on the high end would make a significant difference. And I think that's kind of the range that he would be in. So I find this super concerning that you know, going into the key time when we know refs tend to let things go a little bit more in the postseason. They let you get a little bit more physical. They call the game differently in the postseason than they do in the regular season for better or worse. This is something that could harm the New Orleans Pelicans if they're not getting the right kind of whistle. And they need to figure out how to get that right kind of whistle. Now, I don't think Willie Green picking up texts if calls aren't going their way is going to do anything. Really don't. I don't think that truly matters. But they need to make sure that they are kind of like on the refs, using their challenges wisely and things like that, because this has the potential to make or break their season. We just talked about the standings, right? It's tight. They're in control for the sixth seed right now, but that could change any day. It could change after this game. You can't let something like the referees you know, impact it in a negative way. But it goes beyond just not getting the calls, right? You know, a lot of people were upset over Willie Green talking about the team losing their composure in that game against, I was it OKC? Okay, I forget who it was where, you know, everyone got ejected and, and all of those things. You know, what I think he meant by that and the way I kind of looked at it too was that, you know, that team let the refs really get to them and kind of take them out of their rhythm and it was ultimately very disappointing. I think it was Orlando. It was Orlando. That was the game. You know, that let them kind of get shook a little bit. Like the moment, no, not that the moment was too big because I don't think it was, but that it just got under their skin and they were more frustrated with that, complaining to the refs than just playing the game. You're, you're not going to get the calls you want just because the refs have been a little bit different post-All-Star break. But also when you have a game like that, if the Pelicans run into a situation like that, look, there's literally nothing you can do about it in the moment. You're not going to be able to get the result or anything like that overturned or changed. You just have to be ready to respond in the best way that you can. The players need to be ready for something like that. The coaching staff needs to be ready for that too. Look, it's not fair if you're not getting the calls you should be getting and all of those things. Don't get me wrong. But again, there's literally nothing that you can do about it and life's not fair. So if that's the way that the refs are going to call it, you need to be able to adjust, to adapt, to keep your head, keep your cool and be able to go out and score to try and win a game because losing a game, even if the refs are terrible, Terrible in that, and we'll talk about it here on Locked On Pelicans, is still a loss and it won't change anything. So, complaining about it, being upset about it, won't change 
anything, fair, unfair, you've got to just deal with it and handle with it. And like, again, that sucks. That sucks. That's not how it should be. I agree with you. But with the rest only calling two free throws in a game like that is super weird to me. And that concerns me about what things could look like a little bit in the future when it comes to the Pelicans and a lot of their, you know, run for the postseason. So they're going to need to be sharp and on point. That means what we talked about in the first segment, ball movement, cutting, Zion with the mid-range. When Brandon Ingram comes back, they're going to need his playmaking things, certainly. And I like the idea of him with the ball and them using some of those flash cuts and other cuts that they've been using a little bit more frequently to be able to get guys the ball and create even more looks. There should be more space for some of those type of shots with Brandon Ingram out there on the court and his playmaking and the gravity that he has as a player. Don't get away from all of that. Don't get away from all that because you are frustrated with the referees in the NBA. I'm always frustrated with the referees. I'm sure you are too. But it doesn't change anything, right? If the game's unfair, the game's unfair. You just have to handle it. It's how it goes sometimes. It's annoying, but that's how it is with officiating in kind of any sport, right? Unless it's such an egregious thing. Like, I don't know, pass interference that should have been called. So... But in the NBA, it's a little bit different how the officiating impacts the game and in the flow of all of those things. So they got to be ready for this. And I hope that the front office is preparing them. I hope the coaching staff is preparing them for like, here's our game plan or here's what we're going to do if a if, if the referee decisions aren't going our way. And I think if they have that kind of in the, the back of their mind, in their bag a little bit, that's going to be a good thing and really make them ready for the postseason. Think the refs are going to impact anything in the playoffs? Let me know in the comments down below. So that's going to do it for this episode of Locked on Pelicans. Thank you all so much for listening. As always, I'm your host, Jake Madison, at Nola Jake on Twitter. Game tonight against the Sacramento Kings. We'll recap it tomorrow and see where the Pelicans stand. Got to get this one against the Kings. This is about as big as it gets. Be back with you all tomorrow to recap the game. This is Locked on Pelicans, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.